Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Hey, very glad to have you with us for the Thursday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Jim Garrity is off today. Glad to have in his place John Gabriel, longtime editor at Ricochet.com. He is the undisputed king of stuff. That will never be disputed. He is also a columnist with Discourse Magazine with the Mercatus Center and the Arizona Republic. And John, it's good to have you with us again. Uh, great to be on. Always great to chat with you. Those who follow you on Twitter will know that your coffee cup is never far away, and that will come in very handy, actually, uh, yeah. later in our podcast today when we get to our crazy martini. But let's start with our good martini. We're calling this the good. It's, it's certainly crazy uh, on some level as well. Vladimir Putin, fresh off his uh, interview uh, from Tucker Carlson, has been interviewed again. I'm not exactly sure by who. But he was asked who he endorsed in the American presidential race, and he's going with Joe Biden. Uh, he says that President Biden uh, is, quote, more experienced and more predictable than Donald Trump. Trump is saying that's a compliment. The mainstream media is now saying that Moscow watchers are saying that there is a sinister uh, idea behind that, uh, perhaps to to trick Americans into thinking that he fears Trump more or something like that. Uh, he also uh, went on a great length about how lucid Biden was at their meeting three years ago in Switzerland. So um, if that's the case, then we know he's probably gaslighting us, John. But uh, what do you make of Putin's tactics here and how both sides are trying to uh, score a win off of it? I've read books about grand strategy throughout history and how shrewd these leaders were in past eras. And now I just feel like we're all trolling each other. Because uh, the whole thing just feels like Vladimir Putin is now a Twitter troll. I'm sorry, an ex troll. And uh, just giggling as he uh, makes an endorsement, withdraws a different endorsement. Um, it is kind of entertaining because, um, kind of on a surface level, the press has tried to turn Russia back into the old Soviet Union boogeyman that uh, those of us in Gen X grew up with. Uh, fearing, and now we're just kind of like, wow, they can't even uh, really mess with Ukraine effectively. I don't think they're out to get us. Um, but it is kind of funny to see uh, Putin endorsing, and I wouldn't be surprised if he switches it to Trump, and then later he puts it back to Biden, just to kind of keep everybody off guard. American voters, you don't need to care about who Putin endorses. Uh, you can vote for your own preferred candidate who is at least 78. So um, those are the choices <laughs> we have. Two very, very, very old men. And um, Putin is uh, no spring chicken either, I might add. No, he's not. Now, eight years ago, I believe Putin effectively endorsed Trump uh, mm -hmm. after having dealt with Hillary, I guess, as secretary of state or, or something. Remember, she brought the reset button, which actually didn't mean reset. Uh, it was a whole embarrassing thing at the beginning of the Obama administration. So who knows what uh, what game Putin is playing here. But uh, my guess is he probably doesn't like any of them. In terms of the other story that we heard on the Russian front yesterday, we thought about making this a martini, but it's it's so odd and we haven't heard enough about it to, to really dig into it. And that's that the House Intelligence Committee chairman yesterday, Mike Turner, said uh, that he needed to make a public alert about a major national security issue. And over the next few hours, uh, things dripped out that it was Russian-related, it was nuke-related, and it was space-related. Uh, his public call about this uh, seemed to catch the White House off guard. Other people uh, are suggesting this is just a, a tactic to get more Ukraine uh, aid passed or perhaps dealing with FISA warrants, which were supposed to be uh, reformed in a vote uh, apparently today. So, And that's now been canceled, at least postponed. So uh, I don't know what you make of this. We don't have a lot to go on, but everybody seems to have their talking points lined up here. Yeah. Um, and that's what kind of concerned me about the story is how quickly you could see the narrative form in real time as people wondered how to react to it. Um, you had um, a lot of people, the first ones to blame Russia were kind of the same people who promoted Russiagate endlessly and how Hunter's um, laptop was just Russian disinformation. So um, skepticism is definitely understandable. And who knows what uh, the White House showed the House to try to twist some arms to get them to support more funding for Ukraine. So right now it's a wait and see. And I'm sure, you know, Putin definitely doesn't have America's best interests at heart. 
but um, I don't know. I'm not exactly hiding under my covers, um, worrying about uh, this uh, criminal genius that is uh, Putin, because it seems like the only moves he's made in the past, I don't know, decade plus, have been rather foolish ones. So we will see. Hopefully um, it's not a big deal. Uh, finally, people a couple hours into this news cycle were like, actually, this isn't anything super urgent and it's not that big a deal. So the alarmism of the initial reports um, don't seem to um, have all the weight that a lot of people thought they would did. Yeah, we'll find out if we hear anything more about it. But I think what you alluded to earlier, John, is the big takeaway here is that the intelligence community has played politics enough over the last several years is that there's a natural skepticism now. And so if there is a genuine threat, they're going to have trouble getting a decent chunk of Americans to believe it. And it's their own fault. Yeah, exactly. Um, I can imagine. Um, I, I've kind of thought before we all remember where we were when we found out about 9-11. And boy, these days people would be saying, oh, it's AI. It didn't really happen. Um, you know, they'd be, it'd be blaming the Belgians by the end of the day. You know, it's just like... <laughs> Everybody has a hot take on things, and it's very tough when Washington has a long history of getting things wrong. Um, most of the media, the same. Um, it's kind of tough to uh, believe what's going on, especially as they are, uh, yeah, bragging about, uh, I don't know, Putin space lasers and how he loves Joe Biden. So everything's yeah. going to be a little crazy in an election year. Yeah, you don't want incompetence or uh, political gaslighting. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. sometimes we're dealing with both, and that's, yeah, that's right, definitely not right. good. Well, let's talk about Four Patriots. Fantastic products there. You can find them at fourpatriots.com slash martini. When you buy the Patriot Power Generator 2000X, you get the free solar panel and free shipping on orders over $97. The Patriot Power Generator 2000X is worth its weight in gold because it now has double the capacity and it's expandable so you can run the big appliances, your fridge, your freezer, medical devices, whatever you need. It comes with 12 outlets, including four AC outlets, plus two USB-C outlets that you can charge your phone on 20 times faster than a regular plug. How great is that? It runs on a solar panel, obviously, since you get that free. So no gas, fume-free, silent and safe. 100% satisfaction guaranteed. Also, some last chance deals on the Patriot Pure items, the UV phone sanitizer, the UV wand, sanitation solution machine, and the disinfecting power bank. Visit 4 slash martini to get your Patriot Power Generator 2000X with free solar panel included. Plus, get free shipping on orders over $97. Save more and get peace of mind now by going to the number 4Patriots.com slash martini. That's 4Patriots.com slash martini. All right, John, on to our bad martini now. And of course, there's a big debate playing out in Washington on what to do about additional aid to Ukraine. The Senate has passed that legislation. The House Speaker, Mike Johnson, has said it's uh, going to have a tough road in the House of Representatives. Whether it gets through ultimately, we will see. But there was an interview yesterday uh, in National Review, I believe it was Noah Rothman interviewing Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell. And the big headline here is that Mitch McConnell is worried that if this bill doesn't pass ultimately and gets signed into law by the president and take effect, that our own ability to defend ourselves is going to be jeopardized. The question from Rothman is this. You noted that this is basically an effort to rebuild our defense industrial base and replenish our ordnance stock and those of our allies. If this doesn't get passed, is there a plan B to do that within a realistic time frame necessary to meet the foreign challenges that the Pentagon outlines? And Mitch McConnell says, I don't know how because the budgets we've been passing for the Defense Department are not adequate. And so it was a little over a year ago, John, here on the Three Martini Lunch that Jim and I were talking about a report from the Center for Strategic and International Studies, longtime think tank based here in Washington, where it said we were simply not ready if anything were to happen between China and Taiwan. They said in a major regional conflict, such as a war with China in the Taiwan Strait, the U.S. use of munitions would likely exceed the current stockpiles of the U.S. Department of Defense. According to the results of a series of CSIS war games, the United States would likely run out of some munitions, such as long-range precision-guided missiles, and this would occur in less than one week in a Taiwan Strait conflict. So I don't know if things have improved by then, but John, this really should not be tied together. I mean, our our number one goal here, of course, when, when you're a lawmaker in Washington and a president of the United States, to keep the country safe. 
having what we need on hand to protect this country should be independent of what we're doing to help another country, regardless of how much merit you think that aid is. Exactly. And again, being kind of skeptical of what comes of, out of Washington um, as these bills, I don't know, seem, seemingly get forced on the public are, OK, is this real? Is this real? Are we really out low on um, munitions? Um, it's kind of hard to tell, but uh, seeing how the Defense Department has been acting the past at least 10 years, um, it probably seems likely that they, you know, are not completely replenished. How that is related to Ukraine is beyond me. Um, I, I think in Washington, they don't seem to understand that Look, I, I think most Americans are fine with giving a helping hand to countries like Ukraine, uh, Taiwan, of course, as well. But you got to do the basics at home first. You got to make sure we're protected first. Uh, we elect to do to protect us, to somehow manage our economy in a wise way. And if you aren't getting those basics right, of course, Americans are not going to be eager to be shipping money overseas. Because, I don't know, they see potholes on their street back home. They see uh, military ineffectiveness. They see a very tough and struggling economy. And just to say, oh, yeah, well, we need to pay for Ukraine before we pay for these things at home, before we take action on these things at home, it's a bit tough to swallow. Um, you can pass these things as individual items. And I'm sorry, um, I'm ex-Navy. I know that the military has the money they need. Yeah, it's been a while, but the amount of, you know, we always hear about fraud, waste, and abuse in government. Um, there's a whole bunch of money in the military, and uh, we might have to, I don't know, get rid of a certain acquisition here or there for some uh, congressman wants a certain ship or cool missile built in his district that doesn't really pass muster. There's all sorts of programs that can be trimmed back to get the basics done. And that's what McConnell has to do, uh, regardless of what we end up doing to help Ukraine. I mean, it's just basic common sense. Be in position to defend yourself uh, until before you can help defend anybody else. And if there's an urgent situation, you have to ship munitions overseas mm -hmm. right, right away. Then you replenish that. I understand that. But I mean, this right. is an extended, prolonged process now going on two years. And so you need to have a plan in place to make sure that uh, you are able to handle whatever you need to handle national security wise. And with all these hot spots popping up around the world now, China threatening Taiwan, Iran rattling the saber. And we're always hearing that they're on the brink of having a nuclear weapon. Right. And then, I mean, it's just there's a lot of hot spots. And if you want to be a deterrent in any of them. The only way you're going to be able to convince bad guys not to do bad things is to project strength. Hopefully this is just kind of positioning um, by McConnell and by the people who are really trying to push this particular bill. But I think at this point, um, Congress should have learned, both sides of Capitol Hill should have learned that these gargantuan omnibus, um, everything and the kitchen sink need to be funded in one single bill. Guys, I, I think you could get through a Ukraine aid package, but when you start hiding all these other things in it, tying it to 15 other agendas, um, just pass it straight through. And uh, be honest with the American people. I think you'll get it through. I think it'll pass. And then pass another one to, for aid for Israel, say you can do separate things on the border as you need to. But instead of tying them all together, I, I think... Uh, how about discrete bills that are easy to read that everybody can get behind? Amen. Amen. I love the idea of single issue bills. It, it still hasn't gotten nearly enough traction on the Hill, but right. there are more people talking about it at least. But yeah, I can't even remember the last time we had true regular order on spending Jeez, bills. Yeah. It all ends up in one giant pile at the end of the fiscal year or sometimes beyond. We still haven't figured it out for fiscal year 24 yet. Again, it got kicked to March. So who knows when we're finally going to get this right, but it doesn't seem like it's anytime soon. If you need better sleep and with all these uh, issues facing the United States, so maybe it's keeping you up at night. Well, BioOptimizers, the makers of Magnesium Breakthrough, are offering you a 14-day sleep challenge. All you have to do is go to BioOptimizers.com slash martini free, and then all you have to do is pay for shipping, and it's yours. And you will see how effective this is. You just take a couple of these capsules every day at dinner and you will get better sleep. And unlike other magnesium supplements that might be giving you one to two forms of magnesium, Magnesium Breakthrough contains all seven forms of magnesium designed to help calm your mind, help you fall asleep, stay asleep, 
and wake up refreshed. It also helps to improve digestion, supports muscle recovery, and healthy bone density. To get your free 14-day supply of Magnesium Breakthrough, again, visit biooptimizers.com slash martini free. This offer is only available at biooptimizers.com slash martini free. That's martini free, all one word. Overcome the struggle and get the most relaxing sleep ever with Magnesium Breakthrough. Just pay shipping. Go to biooptimizers.com slash martini free biooptimizers.com slash martini free. All right, now we have gotten to the issue that has John Gabriel ready to go. He's spitting mad. And the issue is coffee, specifically caffeine. Esquire with a long piece on how we need to clamp down on caffeine. And the headline is actually is it time to quit coffee for good? I know what John's answer already is, but here is one of the most absurd paragraphs I've ever seen in print. So ubiquitous, says this column, is caffeine in our culture that it doesn't even register to people as a drug. Step out of the office for a mid-afternoon cigarette and people might look at you askance. Get caught doing a bump of coke in the office bathroom as a midday pick-me-up and it's grounds for immediate termination. But slam a monster or a quad shot Americano at work and people will think you're a go-getter. And so they talk about how the typical cup of coffee gives you uh, 100 milligrams of caffeine. And then they warn, warn, warn you with drastic images here that if you have 10 to 14 grams of caffeine, you're going to die. And if you have over one gram per day, which is a lot, be more than 10 cups of coffee a day, you could suffer from caffeine toxicity. And so... They're trying to tell you it's bad for the planet. They're trying to tell you it's bad for your health. And I know, John, you just don't care. From my cold, dead hands, Esquire magazines, there is no way on earth you're going to... I, I think it's in the Constitution. Well, the Federalist Papers, at least, my right to coffee. And uh, yes, I will exercise that right every day. Um, I started as um, when I was in the single digits, a very young person. Um, I had an uncle that got me hooked on this... Uh, cocaine-like substance known as coffee um and uh i enjoy it i love it it is a way of life and esquire my gosh i know people are having fun i know people enjoy a very small pleasure in life you, that doesn't mean you need to stomp on it and throw it out and that's what i feel like with these uh crazy moral panics that hit us it's just like my gosh people are so upset that one person enjoys something that the author doesn't so Nobody can enjoy it. Caffeine is good. It is wonderful. And it is um, a very good reason to uh, wake up every morning. It is. And just because some people are having trouble because they, you know, slam half a dozen Red Bulls and are completely irresponsible doesn't mean that you, I don't know how many cup of co cups of coffee you have a day. I'm sure it's two or three or maybe seven, but I don't know. <laughs> but in, in the end, uh, you know, most people don't have a problem because they're not crazy. Yeah. And the fact that he thinks that people don't understand that caffeine is a drug is a little bizarre yeah i probably in college it probably was seven cups a day now it's maybe two you know one to two usually two i guess it, well my cups of coffee are kind of like two cups and one basically but still um over time i've kind of slowed down because i just don't need it as much and when you're an old duff you know you have coffee after 6 p.m and uh you never get to sleep again as long as you live um, but yeah, I think people are very used to uh, caffeine, and I even think it's not as bad as a bump of cocaine as uh, this guy likes to uh, compare a cup of joe to. It's just crazy. Now, John, you're such a jovial, positive, outlooking, non-cynical person. What are you like before you have your first cup of coffee in the morning? Please avoid me when I have not had my first cup of coffee. That's actually um, a, a big transition um when I first got married, I just had to sit my wife down and say, look, yes, you can say good morning to me. I will probably mumble good morning back, but please, for your sake, um, unless you want to see the crabbiest John you've ever seen in your life, just don't chat with me before, I don't know, halfway through my first cup of coffee. Then I'm fine. But uh, yeah, I, I really need it first thing in the morning. Um, the thing is, too, um, there have been times when I'm just like, yeah, I want. To, I don't want to be addicted to caffeine, so I've gone caffeine-free. But what I hated was just the ritual of a warm cup of coffee in my hand. And uh, just doing that first uh, thing in the morning, it was almost like a psychological trigger for me to say, okay, let's roll up our sleeves, let's get some work done. 
Boy, come for the defense of coffee. Stay for the sound marital advice. You're getting it all here today in the Three Martini Lunch. Yeah, I'm a full spectrum pundit here. John Gabriel, sir, thank you so much for filling in for Jim. We'll talk to you again soon. Great to be here. Talk to you soon. John Gabriel, longtime editor-in-chief at ricochet.com. He is also the undisputed king of stuff and columnist for Discourse Magazine from the Mercatus Center and with the Arizona Republic. Jim Garrity will be back tomorrow. Please subscribe to the podcast if you don't already and tell some friends to do so as well. Thank you also for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Please keep those coming. They really do help us. Also, get us on your home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch Podcast. Follow us all on X. John is at XJohn, E-X-J-O-N. Jim is at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a terrific Thursday and join us again on Friday for the next Three Martini Lunch.